Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 11 of True Crime All the Time Unsolved. I'm Mike Ferguson, and with me, as always, is my true crime partner, Mike Gibson. Gibby, how are you tonight? Hey, man, I'm doing really well. It's how good. about you, man? I'm great. Yeah, I can't believe uh, the uh, amount of unsolved podcasts that we put out already. 11. It's, that's going really fast, and we just recorded it on our normal podcast we're up to 21 one yep yeah that's amazing to me so just a short period of time how much we've put out so what are we talking about today gibbs man we are going to talk about the tube sock killings all right you picked this one yeah i let gibby pick one i tell you this this <laughs> <laughs> i'm really going out on a limb i here. know he's putting the, the faith in me but uh no i'm just kidding i know but you know, think about tube socks. I mean, when's the last time you seen a pair of tube socks? Anyway, uh, yesterday when I wore them. Well, besides you, most <laughs> people out there probably haven't heard about tube socks since. So this, you can kind of guess the age of. Well, wait a minute, what are we calling tube socks? Are you calling them the white ones with like the, the stripes? The stripes. Yeah, uh, they, they, I just wear the regular white ones. I'm talking about <laughs> this. This is bad. But if you're pulling them up over your calves, maybe that's what's in back in now. I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not wearing the 1970s, early 80s white ones with the blue rings, if yeah, that's what you're talking about. The blue or the red rings? Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Okay. Those are the tube socks. All right. That's that's not what I wear. Yeah. So we're going to talk about the tube sock killings. You know, this is in the community of Mineral, Washington, which kind of borders the counties of Lewis and Pierce County in Washington State. Um, again, we're talking, you know, around the, uh, summertime of, uh, 1985. So Gibbs, I mean, I think these murder cases had some publicity yeah, back, they did. back then. They did. You know, we're, like you said, we're talking 1985. I mean, to the point where they were even featured on unsolved mysteries. So, you know, there was, there was interest in the case, right. To get that type of publicity. Right to make it on unsolved mysteries. But let's just jump right in. Okay. Because I, it's, there's some really fascinating aspects of this case. And I think it's the reason why it jumped out at you and the reason you picked it. So before we dive in, Mike, you know, what always piques my, my interest is, is that in these areas, we always find out. So we're, we're looking into these unsolved murders but we always stumble across like other really disturbed individuals, killers that are within the same, I guess the word zone or geographical area. And, and it just blows me away. I well, mean, it just, it's just bizarre to me that you can have that many people doing bad things in such a small zone. Yeah. And I think, what you're talking about and, and what I get from it is there is a ton of serial killers operating yes. at any one time in any given area, because, you know, to your point, we're going to talk about this case. And at some point we're going to be talking about potential suspects, right? And it's going to be, there's going to be some people that people may be familiar with, right? And it could be a whole host of, high profile that I guess that's what I'm getting to all of these high profile killers at some point or another, they are in areas of these unsolved murders. So you have to look at them. Yeah. They get linked for sure. Yeah. Right? You have to take a look at them because if they killed X number of people, right. Then what are, what's the pr- probability that they also killed these other people that they didn't either get caught right. for or, or, you know, admit to, because, you know, we say that on our other podcast a lot, right? You got caught for these murders, but how many more did, yeah. did, did you somebody, commit? yeah, did yeah. somebody commit, but because they couldn't link them to them or the person's not going to offer up. Oh yeah. I know you got me for these four, right? but I want to let you know, I also killed 10 people in Washington. Right. Yeah, They're just... They don't say it. They're not going to do that. No. So, to your point, it is very interesting 
because we don't know who the killer is. Right. But you can go down the rabbit hole of it could be X number of people. Absolutely. And it never fails. It always, always has the additional tie-ins. Well, and to, to that point, I would say that researching the unsolved cases is harder than researching the solved. Oh, by far. Because on the solved, you've got most of the facts. Yeah. On the unsolved, what you have are the facts of the case, but then you're you're searching. Yeah. And you have tons of assumptions. Yes. And that's, you know. But to me, and some people don't like unsolved cases, but to me, that is part of the interest. You know, who could it be? Yeah, you get to you can't, you're you're playing the detective. Right. We don't know who it is. Let's try to figure it out type right. of deal. Let's start August 10th, 1985. We have Stephen Harkins who's 27 and his girlfriend Ruth Cooper, she's 42. And they leave their Tacoma, Washington home and they're going on a weekend tra- camping trip at Tool Lake which is in Pierce County. Right. So both Stephen and Ruth, they worked at the same vocational school in Tacoma. Okay. And when they did not show up on Monday for that, for those jobs, their families obviously became very, very worried. Yeah. Got a little nervous, I would think. And right away they reported them missing. Now it wasn't very long, only four days later, so this is August 14th. There were some hikers that were, you know, hiking through Pierce County and they find the body of Stephen Harkins. And his body's found near a, a really what I took as a very remote campsite. Yeah, I mean, they were up in the mountains, up in the forest for sure. So Stephen had been shot in the head with a 22 caliber firearm he'd also been shot in the body so one interesting fact gibbs that jumped out at me was that when they found him he was still in his sleeping bag and not only did they find him in his sleeping bag but the sleeping bag he was in the truck bed is where he so whether camping they must have been sleeping in the truck yeah probably get off the ground yeah yeah, that's how my wife would want to camp. She wouldn't want to be on the ground. A little, a little warmer. Yeah, when you're not on the, the cold ground and things like that. Yeah. But I guess what this does, and I think it makes a lot of sense, is it basically is pointing to the fact that he was shot and killed while sleeping. Yeah. Right. He's still in his sleeping bag. It makes perfect sense that either somebody came up on him and you know, shot him in the head, shot him in the body. Yeah. So he didn't have a chance to to fight. Right. Well, yeah, because it's not real easy to get out of a sleeping bag real quick. And, and I assume he didn't have much lead time anyway. Right. Uh, You know, I'm thinking that somebody walked up on him. So when you say he was shot and then from what I understand, it was a 22 caliber. So at point blank, I mean, I know you know more about this than I would. So does a twenty two caliber at point blank, is that going to do a lot of damage? Well, yeah, I, I think anything at, at a point blank range. And, and again, it depends on where. Right. But my understanding of a twenty two, and I think more people are killed with twenty twos in the United States than any other caliber. That's interesting. And a lot of that is because there's a lot of 22s. Now, that mm-hmm. may have changed over the years, but I, I know I heard that at one point. I'm guessing it's cheaper ammo. It Well, it was until... Recent, yeah. Until the ammo kind of jacked up. But it is cheaper, cheaper. Than, than everything else. But one of the, the things about it that I've always read is that unlike some of the more powerful calibers that will go through, mm-hmm. the 22 will go in... But then it will not exit. So more of a ricochet. Yeah. Effect. So what you get is it bouncing around, I yeah. think. And it actually causes a lot of damage that way. Okay. 
because you can get shot, you know, in, in somewhere in your body with, let's say, a 45. Okay. Or a nine millimeter. Right. And the nine's going so fast, it'll go through. But the 22 may not, and it'll bounce around inside all of your organs. So it can, can hit your ribs and bounce a different yeah, direction and do more damage than it that, would. I that's gotcha. my understanding. Okay. So I'm mean, not to get too much into No, I mean, to me, it was just forensics. an interesting, you know, that it was a 22 caliber, mm-hmm. which is, I mean... Well, you think of twenty two as like a little plinker gun. Yeah, like a, if you're hunting squirrels right. or something like that. Right. But I think there are a lot of people that survive a, like one twenty two shot. Mm-hmm. But I also think that you know, in the right place and in in the right ricochet type pattern, it can actually do more damage sometimes the than other calibers. calibers. Yeah. Now there's going to be somebody that knows a lot about guns saying, "Hey, you're fully, you know what?" But that's right. I that's my that. knowledge of it. Yeah. Anyway, and I I do think that that can happen in certain circumstances. So searchers also find their dog Harkins and and Cooper, and the dog has been shot too, which I found very strange. Why shoot the dog? It is it is a weird thing to do. Now. I don't. Do you have what kind of dog it is? Because I don't. I and I don't either. And unless the dog was vicious or attacking, why shoot the dog? So two months later, Gibbs, this October twenty sixth, a skull is found, and it's found near Hart's Lake, and this is about a mile or two from where Stephen's body was found. And ultimately, they would figure out that this was the skull of Ruth Cooper through dental records. And then it's just two days later after that, they find her body and purse, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, basically in the same area. Yeah, not too far away from where, where the skull was found. Now, here's where we get into the interesting part. Right. Because... A tube sock is tied around Cooper's neck. Right. This is obviously tying into the fact that this is called the tube sock killer. At a later date, I asked to observe the sock, which was used around the neck of Ruth Cooper. And when he dumped it out on a desk in the evidence lab, the hair stood up on the back of my neck and I shivered a little. Now they would do an autopsy on Ruth Cooper and the autopsy finding would say that she died of homicidal violence. Although later on, they'd come out and say that she did have a gunshot wound to the abdomen and died of that. Homicidal violence is very broad term. Yeah. That's kind of a strange term to me. Yeah. I mean, it just means you were killed by somebody else. Yeah, I mean, so were they saying because the tube sock was around her neck that she was strangled? No, or... because I, I would think if that was the case, the autopsy would say strangulation. Right. So unless they just weren't sure whether it was the sock or the gunshot. Right. But it sounds like later on they come out and they're they're basically saying she died of a gunshot wound to the abdomen. But why the tube sock around the neck? Well, you know, it's... It's bizarre, and I think that's... Especially since it wasn't... If if it was not the cause of death. Right. I mean, that's just something weird to do. Well, and I think that's why this case is... Inter- it's part it, of why this case oh, is absolutely. very interesting. It, it really is, to, to try to figure some of this stuff out that, that people do. So after they discover Cooper, obviously they've already discovered Stephen Harkins, this is when they start to publicize. I think they go on Crime Stoppers and talk about it. And they're hoping to get somebody to step forward with any information about these murders that would lead to the arrest. Right. And it's around that time that law enforcement, you know, they kind of are thinking that it could be connected to the earlier murders of Edward Smith and Kimberly Levine and those murders were around 
March of 1985. So, what, five five months earlier? About five months before Harkins and Cooper. So the couple, they were from Kent, Washington, and they were abducted, they were murdered, and then the bodies were disposed of near a gravel pit um, on the Columbia River. And Ed's body was actually found on March 10th, and they found the body with his throat cut. They At the time, they didn't know who he was, right? They, they couldn't identify him. They couldn't identify him. So on March 23rd, they find their car. It's at an overlook looking out on the Columbia River at one of the... Uh, I don't know the the places you can park, bef- you know, uh, before you can go out and uh, and camp in the in the uh, in the forest. So eventually, the family reports Ed and Kimberly missing. At that point, they realize the body they found on the Columbia River was Ed. Now they have an extensive search, but it yields no find for Kim. It's not until August that Kim's remains were found. And it was actually just by chance of a passerby going by. And she was, the body was mixed in with the brush, the sagebrush area. And it really wasn't too far from where they, where they found Ed, Ed's body. So it must have been pretty well covered or disguised. Yes. Yeah. On purpose? Um, I think so. So that, that always fascinates me, right? So you, if you kill two people, why do you hide one body and leave the other one out in the open? Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Does it? You know, I don't, I, I mean, yeah. why not go ahead and try to do the rest or did she stumble on that? And he, he or she did not want to go after the body. Yeah. May, maybe she ended up that way naturally, naturally on her own. Right. Because that, that just doesn't make any sense. You're either leaving both out to be found. Right. Or you're hiding both so they're not found. Found. Yeah. Yeah. Just something weird. So the police are able to get lift a fingerprint out of the car. But it's not for about four years before they can actually get a match. And it happens to be an inmate at the Wyoming State Prison. There's an inmate named Billy Ray Ballard. You know what I always say, Gibbs? If you have to say their middle name. Yeah. Billy Ray. Serial killer. Serial killer. That's right. There's a lot of serial killers that have three names. So Washington State, they were able to get him extradited and to keep from getting the death penalty. He pleaded guilty and he received a life with no parole. But he had nothing to do, eventually they realized he had nothing to do with Harkins and Cooper. But I assume they spent a lot of time they, trying to figure that they out. They did. They tried to see if they could put him on that one, but eventually they realized they couldn't. Okay. But so that that's really our first suspect on this one. But again, it just, I mean, here we are with a, as we talked about when we first started the the uh, the intro to the podcast tonight, another weirdo. Yeah, so that was our first rabbit hole. Didn't it didn't turn out. Anything. Didn't turn out to be anything. So let's go back to Steve and and Ruth talking about them. And you know, it was said Gibbs that at the time that Steve died, he had been in some kind of feud with a man. That, and it was over damaging his Harley Davidson motorcycle. Okay. And if there's one thing you don't mess with. Don't touch my Harley. Is somebody's Harley. That's right. Everybody knows that. And apparently Steve and Ruth, they had gone to some wedding reception right before they were going to go on this camping trip. And this individual that Steve was having the feud with, he showed up. At the reception. 
but it was right after Steve and Ruth had left. Everybody said his intent was to confront Steve. So again, we're talking about a second suspect. Sure. With motive. With a motive. And by all accounts, this man appeared to be a viable suspect, but the police were never able to develop any kind of evidence, you know, linking him to the scene of the crime, to the area, you know, nothing like that. And this is rural Washington, you know, I I don't want to say people took care of their own business, but people took care of their own business. No, I I would agree. There was, there's a lot of places in the country like that where, you know, justice was dealt with or whatever you want to say. Yeah. Um, So again, you know, we're not very far into this and already we've got two suspects that I don't want to say the first one they cleared this guy. They never cleared. They just couldn't link him. Couldn't link him. All right. So about a month after they discovered Ruth, this, so we're talking about December, 1985, right? This is where another couple. So you've got Mike Reamer. He's 36 years old. Yeah. He's a tall guy. He's like six foot tall. Yeah. Kind of a a big guy. Big guy. Yeah. And he's with his girlfriend, Diana Robertson. She's 21 and they have a daughter named Crystal. Who's two. Mm -hmm. And, they left their Tacoma, Washington home, and they were going to find a Christmas tree. That's what they were leaving to do. And the place that they chose to go find it was near this, it was called the Nisqually River or Nisqually. Easy for you to say. Exactly. Now, a lot of stuff about Reamer, right? This guy was an animal trapper. And again, we're talking about rural Washington. Yeah. Big, big outdoors guy. Yeah. He, he planned to do some other things on this trip. He planned to check on his traps that he had set in, in the area. And then by all accounts, all, everything went to hell. So what happens later that day, and and this is something I really want to talk about. The daughter, Crystal, who again is only two years old. She's found walking around alone at a Kmart in a town called Spanaway, which is about 30 miles from where the family had been in this forest, you know, looking for this Christmas tree and checking on the traps and all that. Right. So I got, we got to talk about this. Absolutely. Absolutely. So number one, we're going to find out about what happened to to Reamer and Robertson. But before that, how does a two-year-old end up traveling 30 miles alone at a Kmart? Now, I'm not saying she traveled alone. No. How'd she get there? Yes. Yeah. And that's the big mystery. And there's a lot of theories. And we'll probably talk about a few of them as we you know, go down the line here, but, oh. and you got to remember the, this time of the 1985, they probably didn't have 15 cameras, surveillance cameras outside of the Kmart. I'd right? be shocked if they had any, any, yeah. You know, where they could have went and got the tape and seen what kind of vehicle pulled up and right. what car she got out of or whatever. So, but I, I mean, I think the one thing that we know is a two-year-old didn't get 30 miles on their own. No. That's not possible. Not, not at all. I mean, a two-year-old alone in the woods would probably die there in the woods. Absolutely. With, with nobody else to help them. I, I, just, I just don't see any way that... And, and plus, a two-year-old couldn't walk that far. So if you're the store manager or... A- you know, a, a customer, you see a two-year-old standing out in front of the store. I mean, you're thinking, where's the parents? Yeah. Well, and, you know, so witnesses would describe her as as being dazed, and she wasn't talking right away. So Crystal was only able to really provide 
one important piece of information when she was asked about, you know, obviously they were asking her, where's your parents? Where's your parents? And she said, just one thing, mommy's in the trees. So Gibbs, I I think in researching the case, there's a lot of speculation about what that statement means. Right. And there's a lot of people or there's people that are, have very different opinions on what mommy's in the trees means. Right. Now I think you and I, and maybe we agree, maybe we don't. I think what I saw probably the most and what made the most sense to me was that a two year old saying mommy's in the trees means mommy's in the forest yeah, and, or in and, the woods. And I agree with that. You know, have, having kids knowing how their, their thought mind process, works, yeah, their mind yeah. works at two. That's, that's what they're trying to say. Yeah. I, I believe that too. But if you research this case, there's a lot of people that think, Oh, absolutely. You know, whether, you know, she's hanging from a tree, right. she's up in the trees, all kinds of different things. But so Crystal, the two year old, she's placed in temporary foster care. And it's not until two days later that her grandmother sees a photograph of her on the local news. And as soon as she saw me, she put her arms out and said, Grandma. And they put her down and she ran to me. And and I've had her ever since. So obviously that was a a clip of the grandma. So now, Gibbs, we get into the police search for Mike and Diana. And they're searching on foot. They're searching, you know, using planes. Because, you know, you got to remember, this is probably not a, a real easy area to search. Yeah, you, you know, we know it's a forest area, and I think they're they're trying to look for a needle in a haystack, you know? I mean, they're trying to find Mike's uh, 1982 Plymouth pickup truck, but the searches aren't turning up anything. No, they're finding nothing. So it's not till February 18th, and that's really, you know, two months after the couple disappeared and two months after crystal shows up at the Kmart right. that a motorist discovers Diana Robertson's corpse and it's buried in a snowbank near a logging road right off of uh, Washington state route seven. Mm-hmm. And this is in mineral Washington. Yeah. So they're deep in the forest around that area. Yeah. Now they're still searching for Mike and by all accounts, they've got, you know, over 50 law enforcement officers. They've got a bunch of volunteers. They're searching the woods around the murder site. They the, even bring in bloodhounds. And I think this, because of the amount of snowfall that they get in that area, I think it keeps setting them back, right? I think they make a little progress and, you know, trying to close off certain areas, but then it snows and it, it sets them back a few, a few more days. Yeah, I think I think they have, you know, six plus inches of snow that that's falling. So that that's definitely going to make it difficult. But the one thing they do find is Mike's red pickup truck that you mentioned. And they find that pretty close to Diana's body. Now, in the truck, they discover something very. Mysterious, I I, guess, is the right word. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. It's a handwritten note. They find it on the dashboard of the truck. And all it says is, I love you, Diana. So I guess the question, Gibbs, is where did this note come from? Yeah. Was some, did somebody, obviously somebody put it there, but right. was it, was it Mike Reamer? Was it a final goodbye type? And we don't know because they haven't found Mike, you know, they're, they're still looking for Mike and, I mean, I think that's one of the questions, right? That That's a, a central question. Who put the note there? If it was Mike, he's with Diana. I'm not sure why he would need to write a, a letter that says, I love you, Diana. Right. I think some of the other theories are that it was someone who put it there to throw the cops off. Right. So Diana's mom comes forward. And she looks at the envelope and, and she claims that it is Mike's handwriting that's on there. She she was very sure of that, 
but I don't think the authorities were. I feel that it was Mike's handwriting. I have cards that he had given to her on different holidays and things that he signed exactly the same way. I know that Louise Conrad says that handwriting is Michael Reamer's. However, the FBI laboratory is not able to tell us conclusively that that is so. Why did someone put that there? Was it Michael Reamer as a final goodbye, Diana, I'm sorry? Or was it someone who put it there to throw off the authorities and make them think that? But, but you know, you know that he says that on the uh, on the clip there. But the other thing is, it could just been something that he wrote on an envelope at one point and, and gave it to her. It was just in the truck. So I think the other thing they find in the truck are blood stains, and that's where we have to talk about the autopsy that they do on Diana, because what it finds is that she was stabbed seventeen times. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. And normally, you and I have talked about this before, mm -hmm. that type of number means something. It's aggression. It shows anger. It shows, and it, and it normally points towards either somebody close yep. to the victim, is what I think, right. or it points to somebody that's very, very upset with the victim. Yeah, you, you've done something really bad to get that person flared up like that. Yes. I mean, 17 times. So... We said the autopsy shows she was stabbed 17 times, but maybe even more important is that she, just like Ruth Cooper, was also found with a tube sock tied around her neck. Yeah. So right away, I mean, I don't know how you can get a better link between two different sets of killings. I mean, you're talking within months, within miles. You know, yeah, I mean, this is not like you know, somebody used the same type of ligature knot, or I mean, this is an actual tube sock, right? And it's noted that they were, they were tied the same knot method, yeah. So, so even, even more, yeah, evidence that these are linked together. So, going back to the guy that that had was having the feud. You know, so if it was that guy, why would he kill the other people? Right. Right. So if we're talking about suspects, does that kind of make you lean away from him? So they don't, they still don't know where Mike is. Yeah. And they're still looking. They are still looking, but what they don't know if Mike's alive nope. or he's dead. Right. So what it causes is for him to become a suspect. Which would be natural anyway. If you don't have him, right? I mean, your spouse is normally the number yeah. one suspect. Almost always. Yeah. So one of the very first theories I think that comes out from police is, you know, did Mike kill Diana? Did he take his daughter to the Kmart store and then just take off? Drop her off there and take off. Now, the flip side of that, and I think the other theory is that an unknown serial killer killed both couples and then hid Mike's body and they just haven't found it yet. Right. Right. So it's either right now, I think they're operating on one or the other. One of two things. Mike's the killer and he killed both Diana and the other people and the other couple because of the tube sock. Right. Or it's an unknown. Right. Serial killer. And they're, and they're still searching, trying to find Mike. I think his buddies are out, or his buddies. He searched from the spot where Mike would normally start his trap lines, and we followed the whole trap line. And we searched for probably two, three hours without, without nothing. So to answer your question, yes. Yeah. His buddies are out yeah, looking for looking, him. And they can't find him either. They can't find him. But, you know, I think we have to talk about Mike and Diana. Because it was no secret that they had a very rocky relationship so much so that at the time they took this trip, she had a restraining order against him. She did, which is kind of strange. You know, the order of protection started because 
Mike had kicked down their apartment door and by all accounts, he had pushed her face repeatedly down into the carpet. But I guess the couple had kind of reconciled, you know, Mike and Diana had reconciled just a short time because obviously if she was scared enough to, you know, get a a protection order, she's not going to be taking a trip with him. Right. I wouldn't think. You wouldn't think. He beat her up. He took everything out on her. He blamed her for things that he did. If he was seeing somebody else, he would turn it around like Diana was seeing somebody else and justify it, you know, in his own mind. I don't know why Diana let Mike come back in. Maybe because she had Crystal. I don't know, maybe he was a sense of security for her. The only thing I can tell you is that she loved him. Often, the victim allows the assaulting party back in. It's, it's really very common. Diana had told me that Mike had threatened to kill her and that he could get away with it. And I had told her to be careful and that he couldn't get away with something like that. He was just saying things to scare her. So we touched on the handwriting yep. note and we talked about how Diana's mom was convinced that Mike had written that. And I think what she thought it was, was some type of an apology. But again, the FBI didn't quite agree. They they weren't certain that it was his. I think what they, they had a strong suspicion that because they couldn't find Mike, that he had also been killed that day at the same time as Diana had, but yet they just hadn't been able to discover his body given the amount of wilderness and rugged terrain and and all of that. I mean, again, this is not an easy place, I assume, to conduct a search. No, I mean, this is, again, thick forest area. It's quite a while before they're able to figure that part of the equation out because it's not till March of 2011 that some hikers discover a pair of boots and they find a a partial skull. And that is later determined to be Mike Reamer. Yeah. I mean, this is all within a mile radius of where, Diana was found. So I I think that goes back. I think that even lends more credence to what we're saying. Yeah. Right. So if it, it took them what, 25 years. Yeah. That's all before they found anything. And it was only a mile from where Diana was. That tells you how hard it is Mm -hmm. to, yeah. How hard it is to, uh, to search that. Yeah. Cause at this point, then little crystals, 27, yeah, that's that's amazing. Wow. Now, the one thing about it, because it had been so long, they couldn't really say how he died. The only thing they could rule out was a gunshot wound to the head because they had the skull. Right. So then you still had some different theories. Did was he was he shot by the killer or was he the killer and he it was suicide? Did, yeah. did did he did he kill Diana? Then did he turn the gun on himself after he drove Crystal up to the Kmart, came back, and then killed himself? But then again, if he did shoot himself, where's the weapon? Right, and I think that's why I kind of rule that out. Yeah, and I because, do because, um, you know, I. But there, there's, there's more questions. You know, again, how did the large number of searchers miss finding his body. So could the killer have placed the body there after the search? Yeah. I I think these are all valid questions because again, people are wondering how this body was not found when, when it was not that far away from now a mile radius is a good, it's a good ways, but you got to figure they did a lot of searching, but I think most people, Mike, they, they think Reamer was not a murderer. He was a murder victim. Yes. I think 
the overall, now I'm sure there's some people that believe different things, but I think the majority of people, once he was found, ruled him out as a suspect in the murders. Yeah. And I, it, I think it was also said that, you know, you're talking 25 years. So could he have been partially buried or buried and just erosion over time, you know, brought his body up to the surface where he was, you know, where they could find part of it. it, it who knows? So the one thing we haven't talked about, Mike, is that they did find some foreign DNA at both crime scenes. And, you know, obviously as the DNA process became more advanced, they've been able to test it, but they have not been able to match it to any suspect. So that's, that's interesting too. I was also going to say that they also found near Mike's truck, they did find a rifle shell casing, but again, they couldn't really relate it to what happened to the couple. So it could have just been a, 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 a hunter. hunter. I, I'm assuming there's probably a lot of guns being used yeah. for hunting, you know, in that area. So finding a, 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 a rifle case is probably not, uh, is probably not that uncommon. Yeah. I, yeah. I think you probably find those throughout. So Mike, I, I want to talk a little bit before we get into some other suspects about, some of the things that people have said on the internet about this case. Yeah, there's some chatter. There is. There's a lot of chatter and, and a lot of theories. And a couple of them I, I found pretty interesting. And one was that, um, you know, it was thought that this was maybe more of a sophisticated serial killer. Mm-hmm. You know, one thing you have to look at is, you know, you're killing two people which is to me always harder than killing one people. You would know one person. Yeah. I would not. <laughs> and also, you know, like we talked about in the beginning, you know, at least one of these guys was a very competent outdoorsman could have possibly had his own firearm. I don't know that to be the case. I don't know if they found one or not. But it's the similarities in the killings. Right. You know, I think that's that's just too much to overlook. To say that they would be committed by two different people, I, I just don't see it. I think it has to be the connection is too strong. Well. With the tube sock alone. The tube sock alone. So, and, and the fact that they were able to say that the knot of the tube sock was the same type of knot. Too exact. All right, Gibbs, let's talk about a couple of suspects. You know, the first one that I have is a guy named Joseph Burgess. And he was an American, but he had taken off to Canada in 68, I think, to avoid the draft. Yeah, he did. And he was a suspect in some murders that happened to a young couple up on uh, Vancouver Island in 1972. And the evidence in that case was kind of similar. Right. Right. It suggested that he had crept up on this couple while they were sleeping and he had shot them in the head point blank with the 22 caliber rifle. That's just e- very eerily, similar. Yeah. Eerily similar. By the time that the bodies were found, he was long gone. So he became a fugitive. You know, he was on the run for like 37 years. No one knew where he was. I think most people in law enforcement thought he was dead. Either by his own hand or, you know, some other hand. Right. Or some other way. And the tie-in to with him was, well, first, he didn't even, he didn't like the fact that this, unwed Christian couple were sleeping together. Um, and he made that well known throughout the campsite. So that was kind of a motive for that. On top of that, 
The other interesting fact, besides what you've already brought up about the 22 being shot in the sleeping bags, was the fact that their dog was also killed. Just like Harkins and Cooper, the first um, couple murder that we were talking about, how their dog was shot. Yeah, that's eerie. It is. I mean, it's I mean, it's kind of okay. well, again. Could it be a coincidence? It'd be a hell. It'd be a heck of a coincidence. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot of tie-ins. So you can kind of see a pattern, and that's why I think the police were interested and wanted to have a discussion with him. So he surfaces later on. He does. All right, Gibbs. So the crazy thing about Burgess is he surfaces again in two thousand nine. And it's at this point, he's in New Mexico, and by all accounts, he's been stealing from these local cabins for like a number of years. You know, I think the guy was like a survivalist. I think he was able to live, you know, kind of off the grid, but obviously it sounds like he would come in and steal stuff from time to time when he needed something to eat. Some plies and things like that, maybe. Yeah. Well, they got tired of that, obviously. So the sheriff's deputies, they set out, they set up a stake out and to try to capture this guy. Now they don't know it's Burgess at this point. The guy's loan, he's known locally as the cookie bandit, but Burgess tries to break into the wrong cabin. So it happens to be one of the cabins where the, the sheriffs are, they're trying to catch him in the act. And one sheriff's deputy and the cookie bandit are killed in a gunfire shootout. Now it'd be later once they do fingerprints to try to figure out who this guy is that they find out that it's really Joseph Burgess. Now, does that mean that he killed that he's the tube sock killer? No, but it's it's an interesting thing because like we talk about, these people are moving around. Right. It's just they're crossing they're crossing a path or they're crossing areas that make them a suspect. Yeah. And then again, like we always it's a rabbit hole and you chase it and you try to figure out right how how does it fit in. I mean it's unsolved for a reason. We don't know who did it. But exactly. I guess the point would be you know, if he killed this couple in 72 and then, you know, we know he killed some people later on is the thought that he didn't kill anybody in between that long period of time. Yeah, probably not. Probably not, but it's more likely that he did, but we just don't know who. So could he have been the tube sock killer in the eighties? Very possible. But by all accounts, there's nothing to tie him to the murders. Just an interesting suspect, in my opinion. So when we talk about Burgess, we talk about the 72. Right. Right. That's Vancouver Island. Right. And I think the theory on him is it's not crazy to think that when he re-entered the United States because we know he did. Right. He ends up in New Mexico. Sure. That he would have moved in through the Northwest area. Right. Of the United States, which would have probably taken him, taken him through Washington. He did have some ties to that area of the country. Right. From before. And it was known you know, like I said, that he was a survivalist. So could he have been living out in those woods? Could have. And stumbled across these two sets of couples? I mean, it's plausible. So there's one other case that that is very, very similar to the tube sock killings. And this happens in Oak Ridge, Oregon. Now it happens in 2005. So it's quite a bit after the murders that we've been talking about. And a couple is murdered, but the tie in is that their dog is shot right at, at the campsite. Now there's no tube sock, no tube sock, but 
there and we've got quite a span, but we got a quite a span on all these suspects. Yeah. And we know from covering a lot of cases that sometimes these people go 20, 30 years without being caught. Right. So it's not inconceivable at all that somebody could kill in 72, kill in 85, and then turn around and kill in, in 2005. But and, and I think you're right. And it ties in because, again, another couple, the dog, it's in Oregon, and they're just right on the border of Washington State. I, I, I don't know. You know, you, and then we know, we know, I know, that a year later, in 2006, a mom and her daughter were camping just on the other side of where this happened, on the Washington State side, and the mom was shot and the daughter was stabbed. So, I don't know. It just seems like a lot of similarities. Well, you know what it's telling me? Don't. Don't camp in Washington. Don't go <laughs> camping in either on the border of Oregon and or Washington State. Right. We're gonna get a we're gonna get a nasty letter from the <laughs> You will, Mike. From the travel board in in Oregon <laughs> and Washington. But no, I mean it you know, and again, a lot of people are killed all over the country. We're kind of focusing on these wood woodsy type murders where now on the one that you just talked about that wasn't a couple right so i i know you're saying it was happened the next year but it's a mom and daughter yeah. it's not a couple not a couple but still it's and it was it was a it was a uh, older daughter so but we also know that killers don't always stick with the exact same right mo every single time maybe it's just a fact he's isolating people out in the wilderness yeah. and it's an easy and i think if you were a killer to come across two people isolated out in the wilderness i mean you I mean, can't no, get much easier than yeah that, right? i mean there's no witnesses it's yeah. it's easy to do what you got to do i guess so the one thing that throws me and, and we'll go back to the name of the episode is the tube sock thing yeah you know, again, I still have no idea why. It's bizarre, man. And, and the only thing we know for sure is that I think those two are tied together. All yes. these other ones that we're talking about. Speculation. Yeah. You know, just, tr you know, we're, again, trying to find a connection, try to find if, if, if these can ever be solved. Well, and interesting people that could possibly be connected to yeah, it just like we're getting ready to talk about yeah go you ahead know, we're going to bring up that the fact that um israel keys and you know mike probably would know better than i that you know he was a fairly known serial killer no doubt so israel keys his first crime was in the state of oregon where he admitted raping 14 to 18 year old girls during a period of 1996 and 1998. They also know that Keyes traveled a lot because he was in the construction field. So he would travel basically throughout the lower 48 states. Well, I think the thing about Keyes, Mike, and, and why there are some people that try to tie him into this, and not just this, right? Try to tie him into all kinds of different things. But the but the tie-in for him is that he killed at least four people in Washington State, and he lived in a bunch of different areas of the state. He did at different times. So, you know, I don't and you, I don't think there's anything that directly or really even closely ties him to this case. But like we talked about a lot, right. Serial killers, there's always people that like to say, well, it could be this guy. Right. Well, it could be. Could be. Yeah. He was in the state. He was in that area. Known killer. He, he admitted that he killed some couples in Washington, right? And, that, and that's kind of where his killing career, if you want to call it, started. Sure. 
because he ultimately branched out across the country. Yep. But he started in Washington. Now, the thing about him, though, is most of his stuff, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, most of it happened in the late 90s. Yeah. When talking about the 2004, 2005 murders that happened in Oregon and Washington State that we were trying to tie in to the Tupac killings, the name that comes up is Israel Keys, but in research, and we know how bad of a guy he was, but when you research that, clearly he had nothing to do with the 1985 murders. So, Mike, I think the thing with Israel Keys is if you can put him onto the murders that you talked about in 2004 and 2005, right? then that means that that person could not be connected with the tube sock killings right. unless Israel Keys started killing at age seven. Which we know didn't happen. Well, I don't know. Well, uh, it's true. Maybe that's why there's tube socks involved. Maybe. Because I'm still trying to figure out <laughs> why in the hell there's... What What significance does the tube sock have? Yeah. It's just a bizarre thing, man. You know? Because by all accounts, it wasn't used as a tool for strangulation. No. It's like more like a calling card. Yeah. And if you know how hard a... it would be to strangle somebody with a tube sock? It would be hard, man. It's stretchy. Yeah. Right, it's not like a, a cord. Yeah. Hell, I or... couldn't even get them to stay up on my calves when I wore them. Right, <laughs> I think that's what we're doing. We're isolating the eighty-five murders back down to one person. Right. E- even though we like to talk about all these suspects and it's interesting and all that, I still think you've got one person and them, they may have killed a bunch of other people that we don't know about. Right. But they didn't leave a calling card like this one. Right. So why kill two couples, use the tube sock, never, if they did kill a bunch of other people or even more people, right. They didn't use the tube sock cause that would have come out. Right. They would, yeah. they would have connected it, but I still go back at a base level and say the tube sock is the key. Yeah. Because what's the reasoning behind it? Nobody knows. So, but the killer, the police should really have just looked for the one guy in town with no, uh, no socks on. Just walking around barefoot. Yeah. Cause he it, used up his two, two, he used his two socks, on. two tube socks. So Gibbs, I, I think the one thing that we know is that there still is a mysterious pattern of unsolved couple murders in the Northwest, right? You talked about Oregon. You talked about Washington. Washington. All happened outdoors in the woods. Mm -hmm. Most of them involved some type of gunshot to the head. And really, all of them without motive or a known motive. Right. Right. There's a motive, but we don't know what it is. We don't. That's strange. And then a few of them with the dogs being killed. Right. So you you add all that together and some of these span a number of years. Mm Mm-hmm. And then you have the ones that we we focused on, which are the tube sock killings. Right. And you just wonder if those are isolated two couple murders all by themselves, or did those just happen to involve tube socks? But then you have somebody that's throughout the years, yeah, just change. killing couples. Sure. You know, maybe they wanted to see if they could get something going, you know, and be known as the tube sock killer, but, you know, just couldn't for whatever reason. I mean, it could have been something as simple as that. that well, why that, not? How hard is it to wrap a tube sock around? I don't know. Somebody's I mean, neck. Just depend on when the opportunity came up that they were able to strike. That. They, they didn't have the tube sock with them? Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I'm just 
it's just bizarre just to kill the two couples in that short period of time and be okay with that as a serial as a serial killer. Yeah, and and that's the question: Is it a serial killer? Right. So I go back to the first murder, where Stephen was having that feud with some unknown man. Right. And something popped into my head where I was thinking, so that guy had an axe to grind Mm -hmm. and he killed Steven and Ruth. Right. And to help cover it up, maybe would this make sense? Yeah. I see where you're going with it. Where he comes back later and he kills another couple that he finds through some opportune, you know, chance. Right. But he uses the tube sock twice to connect the two together. Which because, isolates, get, gets him out of the picture now, right? Because he has no connection with the right. second couple. Clearly, he couldn't have done that to the first couple because it's tied into the type of killing. That's a really good point. Yeah, it's just something that I thought about because, you know, as we were banding... If he's listening right now, he probably just... You know what? He should email me at truecrimealltheTime <laughs> yeah. at gmail. That's right. But no, it was just something I thought about because... And, and maybe that would be too smart for somebody to think about. But if you think about it, what a way to sure get the try trail. try to get somebody off of your tracks. Yeah, I agree. Because he has, I assume, no connection whatsoever to the second couple. Right. And by using that weird tube sock thing, he's tied both murders together. Yeah. By everybody's thinking, it had to be the same person. Perfect camouflage. It really is. Yeah, it's just a thought. All right, Gibbs, that's the case of uh, the tube sock killer. Yeah, interesting. It is. Again, a bunch of rabbit holes. And, and again, this is an interesting one if you for listeners if they want to investigate themselves. It's like we keep talking about, you know, you'll find information that will lead you on to somebody else. Yeah. That suspect will lead you to some other rabbit hole. It makes you think, you know, I, I, I looked and I was trying to hope that I could find more information about Crystal, knowing that she would be in her late, well, gosh, what would she be now? She would be 30, early 30s. 34? 34, yeah. Ish. I just thought it'd be interesting to see if if she has put anything out yet, you know, about it. But then again, I mean, I mean it too. How well does she? Yeah, remember? I can't remember imagine she that. remembers anything. Yeah, so unfortunate for her, but uh, hopefully, life has treated her better. Yeah, I hope so. All right, so for Mike and Gibby, stay safe and keep your own time ticking. <laughs> <laughs>